so uh, just as Dr. Liegner had told you some of the good news about these persister drugs and biofilms, I'm going to give you also some very good news today. Um, I'm going to show you, I did something backwards. Most researchers first go into uh, thousands of drug molecules to find what works, look at it in culture, and then do clinical studies. I did exactly the opposite. I'm going to show you 300 patients that we published on dapsone combination therapy. Uh, dapsone is a persister drug used normally for mycobacterium infections. And I came up with this idea based on my work at Mount Sinai actually over 30 years ago in the HIV population who had uh, MAI, Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. Um, these drugs basically are very interesting to use, and I'm going to show you what combination therapy does in culture, which is helping to confirm some of the work we've already published. Uh, and this work you'll see is thanks to Eva Shapi and the work that we did at the University of New Haven together. I have a couple of conflicts of interest, and the first most important one would be that the views expressed in this presentation definitely do not reflect the views of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group, HHS, or the United States. Um, that I can tell you certainly is true. So we know for early Lyme disease, standard treatments are usually short courses of amoxicillin, doxycycline, cefuroxymaxotil, ceftin. They work in 70 to 75% of the cases, um, except we also know that there's symptomatic relapse. And several studies have suggested that the reason that these people go on and have relapses are due to these round body forms, sometimes called uh, cyst forms, L forms, cell wall deficient forms, persister cells, and biofilm forms. And as just as Ken was telling you, for the last 25 years or so, we were using drugs that were not addressing biofilms and persisters. And I can tell you that my experience in the last five to six years has been they have really been a game changer for most of us. So I'm going to show you some of the clinical studies that we reported on the successful use of an intracellular mycobacterium drug, uh, Dapsone. It's usually used for treating leprosy. They also use it for a whole host of other diseases. It's also been out for 50, 60 years like disulfiram. Uh, but the difference is, is that we used it in combination therapy with doxycycline, rifampin, and Dapsone, as well as Plaquenil, which is known to alkalize the intracellular compartment, hit the round body forms, and we used three biofilm agents with stevia, biocidin, uh, and oregano oil in the studies that I'm going to show you. So the first study that we published in 2016 with Dr. Phyllis Freeman, are mycobacterium drugs effective for treatment-resistant Lyme, tick-borne co-infections, and autoimmune disease? And this was a woman with Bisset syndrome, a very unusual autoimmune disease. She had very big ulcers on her tongue in different parts of her body. She had failed 20 years of drugs with a rheumatologist. She had osteoporosis from all the steroids they put her on. And at one point, we discovered she had Lyme. Dapsone is used for Bisset's, but she wasn't getting better. And she had these nodules, these granulomas on her hands that were called Winkelmann's granulomas. It turns out it was Bartonella. And when we gave pyrazinamide, which is a tuberculosis drug used for treating TB and to shorten the course, lo and behold, the Bartonella lesions went away and used with Dapsone, the patient got better for the first time in 20 years. We then went on in 2016 and published 100 patients on Dapsone combination therapy, and we showed that for eight major Lyme symptoms, it was statistically significant that all of the symptoms of fatigue and pain and neuropathy and memory concentration problems, Babesia symptoms, sweat chills, they all got better. The only thing that didn't get better in the first study of 100 patients was headaches. But then we published a second study, and this was published early this year, Precision Medicine Retrospective Chart Review and Data Analysis of 200 Patients on Dapsone Combination Therapy. This was part one of a part two study. And you can see from figure one that all of the symptoms, again, statistically got better. Fatigue, muscle, joint pain, in this case, headaches did get better, neuropathy, uh, memory problems, sweat. So again, it hit Babesia similar to disulfiram. And when we looked at paired sample t-tests for these 200 patients, we found that the p-values were very strong. They were less than 0.001. So dapsone combination therapy was definitely working in clinical practice, but we had not done the prior studies in culture to see if we could confirm that it actually was killing Borrelia. We also looked in the second part of the study in precision medicine, the role of the MSIDS model. Now, having seen over 13,000 patients, I can tell you that all the research we're doing on Lyme is great, but as I'll show you, a lot of the problems we're finding that are keeping people sick are not just Lyme. We're looking at Babesia, which is chronic, Bartonella, which is chronic, Mycoplasma, which is chronic, immune deficiencies, sleep disorders, leaky gut, microbiome deficiencies, mitochondrial dysfunction, POTS dysautonomia. There's up to 16 reasons we found why people stay ill. 
And what's important, the most important parts of this study is that the chronic babesiosis and Bartonella definitely are playing a role in keeping these people ill. But we also found immune dysfunction, that Borrelia was affecting the B cells of the body. Over 20% of these people had immunoglobulin deficiencies with low IgG and uh, over 70% with subclass deficiencies in subclass one and three, which you need to phagocytize and kill the bacteria. But we found a lot of inflammation. We found mold toxins. We found heavy metals like mercury and lead. Uh, we found food and environmental allergies. The point being that if you have inflammation in the body, inflammation of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, IL-6, interferon gamma, whether that's coming from Lyme or Babesia or Bartonella or leaky gut or not falling asleep, you're going to get the same symptoms in Lyme. So when we looked in this phase two study, the part two, at the MSIDS variables, you can see that about 70% across the board, people had multiple overlapping sources of inflammation and downstream effects, especially dysautonomia with POTS, which was in about 40% of the people. And probably half of the women in wheelchairs who've come to me over the years, uh, we got them out of wheelchairs walking, not by treating the Lyme, but by actually treating their autonomic nervous system and raising their blood pressure. When we looked at the co-infection status, though, of these 200 patients on dapsone combination therapy, you can see on the left-hand side that Babesia and Bartonella were playing a very significant role, as well as a lot of mycoplasma and chlamydia and ammonia uh, and viruses that showed up. So what came out of this study is that, just as Dr. Liebner had showed you about persistence, 14.5% of our patients were PCR positive in this study despite months and years of supposedly adequate antibiotic therapy. This is prior to dapsone combination therapy. We had ongoing babesiosis that was positive by PCR and fish. This is despite using classical therapies of mepron, azithromax, or clindamycin and quinine. Bartonella hensile was positive by PCR and fish. This is despite using multiple intracellular drugs. Tularemia titers would increase fourfold. Um, one of these patients went to an infectious disease doctor who confirmed it was active tularemia. We found active brucellosis with positive agglutination. And we even found mycoplasma species like mycoplasma fermentans and penetrans, which are all, again, intracellular infections inside the cells with viruses like herpes virus 6, which reactivated with the immune suppression, both by fourfold increases in titers and PCR positive. So what is the common denominator of why all of these people were sick? They didn't just have Lyme as an intracellular infection. They had multiple intracellular infections like Borrelia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia, Tularemia, Brucella, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rickettsial infection. These are all intracellular infections. And we know that intracellular infections may be resistant to therapy. They're located in biofilms, and they can persist despite standard therapy. But again, you've got to keep in mind that the inflammation could also be coming from lack of sleep and toxins and nutritional deficiencies. This same year, uh, Dr. Feng and Dr. Yang from Hopkins published on stationary phase persistent biofilm microcolonies causing more severe disease. And I would absolutely agree in the human model from what we've been seeing in our patients. When you give dapsone or disulfiram to these patients, you definitely see Herxheimer's like you've not seen before using other medications. So we know from the biology of Borrelia that we may need to use a comprehensive treatment which affects the log phase actively growing forms. And that's what Dr. Liebner showed you with cephalosporins or penicillins. This goes back years. Or round body cystic forms. That's where we use Plaquenil and grapefruit seed extract. And I was the first doctor about 20 years ago to discover flagell uh, work for Lyme, and Dr. Borson then confirmed it. But then we've got the intracellular drugs like tetracyclines, macrolides like azithromycin, rifampin, um, and quinolones, and then the drugs that are affecting these stationary phase persisters in biofilm forms like dapsone, pyrazinamide, daptomycin, and disulfiram. And keep in mind in the studies I'm about to show you, we did use several biofilm agents, but in the culture studies I'm about to show you, we did not. So we went ahead, and this is a study we did with Eva about two and a half years ago. It was a poster presentation. You can see at the bottom where it shows dapsone doxyrifampin. Um, these are the biofilm forms that were in culture. And you can see that after just 72 hours with doxyrifampin and dapsone, the biofilm forms were quite small. In fact, were much su it was superior than other treatments we used. But we really wanted to look in culture and find out what was the effect of dapsone alone and then starting to combine these antibiotics one after another to see how it affected the resistant morphological forms of Borrelia burgdorferi. So again, this was done by Eva Shapi's group uh, with Dr. Freeman and myself at the University of New Haven. 
So we evaluated in the study the effectiveness of dapsone individually and in combination with cefuroxime, but also intracellular antibiotics like doxycycline, rifampin, azithromycin, and we looked at the log phase actively growing spirochetes, we looked at persister cells, and we looked at biofilm forms. We used low passage isolates of B. burdorferi, the B31 strain. They were cultured in BSK media, supplemented in 6% rabbit serum. The stock cultures were maintained in sterile glass tubes and incubated at 33 degrees. And by the way, this is standard things that John Hopkins and other researchers have used in the materials and methods. And the spirochetes in logarithmic phase, when they were actively growing, were seeded on 96 well sterile tissue culture plates, incubated for 48 hours prior to giving them antimicrobial treatment. And the stationary phase cultures were seeded also in 96 well tissue culture plates for five days prior to treatment. For the biofilms, these are in four well Permanox chamber slides or in 48 well sterile tissue cultures. These were in five days to establish attached biofilm forms. And the floating spiroketal cells and aggregates from the supernatant were removed to ensure only surface attached biofilms would be analyzed. We looked at doxycycline alone, all of these alone and in combination. Rifampin at 50 micromoles because that was the dosage that had the best effect in culture. Cefuroxine, Zithromax, Dapsone, Sulfamethoxazole, Sulfochloropyridazine, Trimethoprim, all of these were prepared in standard one-time phosphate buffered solutions and sterilized using uh, micropore filters, and we used pyrazinamide as a persister drug. The testing was done individually on Beriglid burgdorferi and also found effective in reducing the morphological forms. Um, they then were tested in combination. Our control was doxycycline at 10 and 50 micromoles, and as a negative control, we used PBS, which was the diluent for the antimicrobial compounds. So when we looked at how did dapsone work alone and in combination, we used some of the similar studies done at John Hopkins and in other researchers. We looked at cyber green assays for cell growth and viability. We looked at recovery culture analysis. We looked at biofilm analysis by crystal violet assay. We looked at dimethylmethylene blue glycosaminoglycan, or GAG assays, and live dead fluorescent microscopy, which is used by backlight. So here's table one, and you can see the effects of individual and combination antibiotics. Now the log phase, so these are your active growing Borrelia, and you can see that doxycycline was 18% survival. It worked quite well. That's why doxy works when people get EM rashes. But you'll notice the closest to actively growing uh, Borrelia in the log phase was down below was doxyrifampin and dapsone. That was at 19%. And I'll go back to why I think this is important early on when people get EM rashes. When we looked, however, at the stationary phase survival, um, and this is again when we're looking at all these drugs separately, 54% for dapsone, it was the most highly effective drug for these stationary phase uh, persisters, and dapsone doxyrifampin uh, was a little bit better at 51%. Table two, you can see the effect of different antibiotic treatments on the biofilm mass using crystal violet. You'll notice again that dapsone alone was 58%. It was the most highly effective of the drugs we used as a single drug. If you move on and you look to the right, you'll see that these are antibiotics in double combination. The most effective one was doxycycline and dapsone at 65%. We then looked at triple combinations, in fact, the ones we used that we published in these 300 patients on Dapsone, and you'll notice the most effective one in culture, uh, especially looking at biofilm assays, was Dapsy, uh, Dapsone, Doxycycline, and Rifampin at 52%. And then we tried adding on azithromycin as a fourth intracellular drug. It still worked, but not quite as effective as the triple combination. It was at 58%. Table three, we looked at these different antibiotic treatments on the biofilms using GAG content um, with the dimethylmethylene uh, blue assay. And again, you can see Dapsone was the most effective for reducing the GAG content in the biofilms. But again, when we combined Dapsone with doxycycline rifampin, and in this case azithromycin, a fourth intracellular drug, that was the most effective at lowering GAG inside the biofilms, uh, looking at this from the point of view of biofilm GAG studies. Figure one shows you live dead microscopic images. Uh, this is at 72 hours. You can see that again at the lower part of the slides, the dapsone doxyrifampin looks like it's uh, working quite well. But you can see this a little bit better in the live dead staining image. This is a 14 day recovery culture uh, following treatment with these different agents. And you can see there's percentages next to all of these different combinations. You'll notice at the bottom that doxyrifampin and dapsone was 41%. 
It was one of the most highly effective combinations. The only one that was better in this particular case was adding Zithromax. It was a 3% improvement going from 41% to 38%. When we looked at the biofilm cultures, again, you can see that Dapsone, Doxycycline, and Rifampin was again knocking out these biofilm cultures. So the results basically help confirm what we've been seeing in clinical practice for these 300 patients we published in the last five years. The persister drug Dapsone alone are in various combinations, and the ones that worked the best was doxycycline and Dapsone, doxycycline, rifampin, and Dapsone, and doxycycline, rifampin, and azithromycin with Dapsone. Those are, the, those are the combinations that had the most significant effect on all morphological forms of Bieber-Dorfry and even reduced the protective uh, glycos, glycosamino gly, uh, glycan layer of Bieber-Dorfry biofilm. So the conclusion. Our in vitro findings suggest that the antimicrobial agents like Dapsone, persister drugs in combination with other intracellular antibiotics are effective against the resistant morphological forms of Bieber-Dorfry and culture, and it supports previously published findings on the clinical efficacy of Dapsone combination therapy. The major finding was Dapsone as a single drug and in combination with Doxy and Doxyrifampin, as well as Doxyrifampin and Zithromax, had the most significant effect in reducing the stationary phase cells and the surface-bound biofilm aggregates of Bieber-Dorfry among all the different antibiotics that we normally use uh, in our clinical practice. Furthermore, Dapsone alone and in combination was effective in reducing the mucopolysaccharide layer of the biofilms, and these findings might explain at least in part the clinical efficacy that we have been publishing on these 300 individuals in our recent Dapsone combination trials. So we know that a lot of Lyme patients have significant cognitive deficits. In the studies that we published in the Precision Medicine study published this year in 2019, the Dapsone combination group got better with fatigue, pain, neuropathy, headaches, and cognitive defects, but the success of Dapsone was its good CNS penetration. It has antibacterial effects by stopping RNA and protein production. It works against a broad range of pathogens. So again, you saw Bartonella, mycoplasma. We need combination therapy against all of these different co-infections. Its efficacy against the different forms of Borrelia, round body, stationary phase, and biofilm. And the advantage is Dapsone also has an anti-inflammatory effect by converting myeloperoxidase into its inactive product. So the conclusion is the drug combination published in our previous study suggests that Dapsone and Doxy, Dapsone, doxyrifampin, and doxone, Dapsone, doxyrifampin, and azithromycin are the most effective in reducing all morphological forms of Borrelia. And here's the remaining questions. So I had a patient in my practice accidentally take a double dose of Dapsone. I think most of you know this uh, story by now. We put 110 people on this, including my wife, who's here in the audience, and Olivia, who's here. And we now have people, just as Dr. Liegner was telling you, my wife is now two years out. She suffered with Lyme for over 30 years. She had almost every point on the MSIDS model that was active. She has no more symptoms for two years. Olivia is now about a year and a half out. I just saw a patient in my practice last week who was sick for about 15 years. He has no symptoms since doing the high dose Dapsone. So it is working, but who is it working for? Well, we did an analysis of these 110 patients and 70 out of 110 are staying in remission, but the 40 that are not staying in remission, every one of them had active Babesia and active Bartonella by PCR or FISH. Now we have at this point 150 people on disulfiram. Some on disulfiram alone, some on doxy rifampin disulfiram, so I could compare it to what I just showed you with Dapsone, and some on doxy rifampin Dapsone and disulfiram to lower the disulfiram dose to keep down side effects and maybe not have to use double dose Dapsone. I can tell you now that some of the Bartonella patients that I've had difficulty treating for the last 10 years some of them on doxyrifampin and azithromycin with disulfiram are having miraculous results. We are definitely seeing the fact that the biofilms with hitting Lyme and hitting the co-infections, it's working, but these patients are just coming off disulfiram at this point, so I don't know whether they're gonna stay in long-term remission, but the good news for the Lyme community is you can have hope. The persister drug regimens and the biofilms Thanks to all of the researchers from John Hopkins and Stanford and Eva Shafi's group, and everyone has worked on this, has helped uh, clinicians like myself and Dr. Liebner finally figure out how to help the Lyme community. So thank you so much to Bay Area Lyme, to the MSIDS Research Foundation for all of your assistance.